Building setbacks can make or break your construction plans because building setbacks are the distance inside the interior of your property boundaries where the zoning office is not going to let you build. If your measurement is off by one foot, the answer is no. Your permit application will be denied. Your beautiful custom home will not be built until it conforms to the setbacks. And to do that, sometimes it's a little bit harder than you might think. And to illustrate why, what well, we're going to try to do is fit this 40 by 60 foot wide home into a one acre building lot here. And I'm going to show you the way that building setbacks from zoning overlay on the interior of a piece of land just like this. And I'm also going to show you some other setbacks that you might not see in the zoning ordinance that are subtle that create additional setback regulations that you have to manage as well. You're going to see it's not quite as easy as it might look. So just to give you a little bit of an orientation, I want to talk about what you're seeing here. So we talked about the home. This is a one acre lot that's 120 feet wide. It's a rectangle and it's 363 feet deep. The road is down here. As you can see by the compass, the road is to the south. The property runs north. The entrance to the property is here. There's also going to be a slight grade to the property. It runs uphill from the southwest to downhill to the northeast. Let's get started. I want to talk about the zoning class, the zoning district that this property is in. And so this piece of land is inside a, a zoning district that's called R. Can you guess what R stands for? Obviously, that's residential. In a zoning ordinance, zoning setbacks apply typically in three phases. There's zoning setbacks at the front of the property. There's zoning setbacks from the sides. And there's zoning setbacks from the rear. And in this case, the zoning setbacks are 30 feet from the front, 20 feet from either side, and 25 feet from the rear. And they apply to all land in that zoning district. So I'm going to draw that in. So now that we have the setbacks on the property, I want to walk you through what this actually does to the remaining buildable area. So we have the 20 feet on either side, the 20 feet from the rear, we have the 30 feet from the front, and inside the dotted line is our buildable area. And everything between the dotted line and the solid line, which is the property boundary, is the setback where you cannot build. Now what's crazy is we started off with a one acre property, but when you actually do the math, you have 80 feet of buildable width and you have 308 feet of buildable buildable depth after you account for the setbacks. But what that means in terms of acreage is you actually have 0.57 acres, which kind of strains the imagination because how could that be possible? It looks like such a small part of the rectangle, but it's not because when you have a narrow rectangle, just in terms of the geometry, you know, when you come in from the sides, you're knocking out so much of the surface area. And that's the case here because the setbacks themselves actually deduct 43% of the entire property that becomes non-buildable when you comply with the zoning code. So now that we've established the 0.57 acre buildable area, it's plenty of space. Now, if you're lucky, the land that you're gonna build on has some charming natural features, something like a creek, river, stream, or a pond. Lakefront property, even better, but let's just assume that we're buying a smaller property on a smaller budget. But what I'm gonna do on this property is introduce two separate streams that intersect with the property and come into the interior of the property. I'm gonna draw them in right now. So we've now got two separate streams represented by these two blue lines. One is on the southwest portion of the property towards the entrance. The other one is going to be in the back of the property in the northeastern corner. Now, common sense would dictate that you're not going to build directly on top of a stream for a number of different reasons. Even if they let you, you still wouldn't want to do it. That takes this area out of the equation. And it also, you wouldn't build right next to a stream. You'd want to create a little bit of a distance. So really, you're not going to build there or there. So it takes those areas out of play. But what you might not know is that streams also typically have building setbacks. Often they're going to be in the zoning ordinance. Sometimes they will not be. But the stream setback is often referred to as a riparian buffer or a stream buffer. And typically it's going to be 50 to 100 feet. But let's just say it's going to be 50 feet in this case. We have now a setback of 50 feet from the stream. And what that does is this. So you can actually see 
on the property that we now have to game plan for a tighter buildable area than we bargained for. So you have the 50 feet here, 50 feet there. So now that we've established the 50 foot stream buffer, the buildable area in the center of the property gets a little bit smaller. We still have plenty of space, but imagine that you visit this property and you're walking from the front of the property into the interior because you want to scope out the potential home location. But as you're going downhill, you see that the vegetation starts to get a little bit thicker. You may even notice that you see some shrubs, some sawgrass, some reeds, and you're starting to notice that the soil ecology is beginning to change a little bit. The reason that the vegetation on this property matters is because you have wetlands. Wetlands ecology on a piece of land means that the portion of the land that's affected by wetlands is highly regulated to the point where even if you're able to build, it's almost impossible to overcome the regulatory obstacles and it's just not even worth it. Now, a lot of jurisdictions, as long as you steer clear of the wetlands and don't impact the wetlands areas with your construction project, you're okay. However, some places impose an additional 25 foot or 50 foot wetlands setback. It just depends on your local area. In this case, we're going to map the wetlands on the property and I'm going to show you the 25 foot setback that applies to the wetlands. So I'm going to draw it in right now. Now to make matters worse, sometimes when it rains, it pours. In this case, several years back, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, went through their local maps in this area and updated their flood maps. And what they did is they actually marked the location of a floodplain in the back half of this property that also emanates from the stream. Remember that when there's a big rainstorm and there's flooding in an area, the water is gonna run from the uphill to down hill, which means that especially if you have a waterway in your backyard that's prone to flooding, the flood is going to come uphill towards your home. I'm going to show you on this map a location for the flood zone in this case, and I'm going to talk about how the flood zone impacts the building setbacks. Now, flood zones come in a number of different forms and there's different layers of classification to them that have their own regulations. But the biggest category of flood zones from a regulatory and planning standpoint is what's called the 100 year flood zone. Basically like every 100 years, there's a theoretical flood that covers an area of the local map that encompasses the 100 year flood zone. So this is gonna be our 100 year flood. You are able to build within a 100 year flood zone, typically. However, even when you build within the 100 year flood zone, and you're talking about additional paperwork, additional permitting, additional engineering requirements, an elevated building foundation, all this stuff that adds cost to the construction project. Typically in a 100 year flood zone scenario, as long as you don't build in the flood zone, you're good. Meaning you're not subject to flood zone regulations and you typically do not have additional setbacks from the flood zone as well. Now, what we've done is we've introduced all of the elements to this property that once looked so spacious. Now we have a tight squeeze where I think we can probably still fit this home into a buildable area that complies with all the different setbacks, but it's going to be tight. And remember, this is land. It's vacant land. Now, this is rural land too, which means that in addition to the home, we also need to account for the well and the septic system that we're going to be using. Now, wells can typically be located as close as 10 to 25 feet to a building, and septic systems can be located as, you know, even closer, five to 10 feet often, but you know you got to typically separate the well and the septic system by about 50 to 100 feet. And so I think that we're going to have enough room to do that. And I'll show you how I think we can put the home into this site plan and also include the well and the septic system. So let's take a look. Okay, it was a tight squeeze, but I 
think we pulled it off. It's maybe a little more snug than we would have liked, but I think we made it work. I'm going to show you how. Now we have the home here towards the front of the property in front of the flood zone, but behind the stream that goes on the front of our one acre lot. You also have the septic system in the well. Now the well is located uphill uh, from the septic, which is typical. It's not always needed, but often is practical to do it that way. Now, the other thing is the well and the septic on our property, typically they have to be located about 100 feet apart. And we just barely were able to fit that in because the distance from the well and the septic is separated by the home and we measured it and it's going to be 100 feet. So that's going to work. But there's just one problem. You see, there's, there's another well that was installed years back that affects the setbacks on our property. I know you might be thinking, oh, maybe a previous owner has a well on our one acre lot. That's a good guess, but it's actually not the case because the well that is going to cause problems for us, it's not even on our land at all. It's the neighbor's well. I'm going to show you where it is. This well is over the property line. The problem is our site plan didn't factor in the setbacks associated with that well. In most jurisdictions, it's going to be a 100 foot setback, and that's a radius around it. Environmental setbacks that have to do with well, septic, stream, water, flood zone, wetlands, they don't care about the property line. And so this is what people run into because look at what happens. When you have a 100 foot setback, it hurts you a lot because you cannot put a septic system within 100 feet of a well, sometimes 50, but it's almost never less than that. We might be able to move our home into the setback that the septic is prohibited, but the problem is even if we flip the home and the septic system, then the septic system runs into the 100 foot setback from this well. You see? So the wells are a major issue in the country. If a neighbor has a well on their land and you have a site plan that requires careful planning, you've got to know where their well is. You've got to know where all the environmental features are on the property. You got to mark them on the property and you got to know where you're going to put your septic and where you're going to put your well. And you got to know in some cases where the neighbor's septic is, where the neighbor's well is. So it seems complicated, but in the end of the day, it's really not. You've got the building setbacks from the zoning district. You've got environmental features on the property that put additional setbacks in addition to well and septic. On a property like this, would you have enough space to build the home of your dreams? Maybe. But you would just have to mark everything carefully. You'd have to know exactly where your setbacks are. Because at the end of the day, you got to remember that building setbacks can make or break your construction plans. If you like this video and you want to learn more about the nitty gritty details of land buyer due diligence, in particular, the heartbreaking mistakes that land buyers can make and more importantly, how you can avoid those costly mistakes for the land that you're buying. I'm gonna leave a link here to the next video on our channel that I think you're really going to enjoy.